Fighting back against adversity is something Lisa Markham knows well. She's done it her whole life, while breaking down barriers and crashing through glass ceilings at lightning speed. During her 25 years in broadcasting, Markham's passion was the operational side of business development, seeking out innovation and technology to prepare for television's digital future. Starting out as a young account executive at a Northern California station, her rise to the top was fast and furious, quickly advancing as executive vice president and general manager of KMPH-TV in Fresno. She soon met her future husband, radio executive James Routon, the two dominating the market and referred to as the city's power couple. Hired by the Tribune Company of Chicago, she was the first female vice president and GM in the company's 150-year history. In San Diego, Markham built KSWB from the ground up, the first digital HD TV station in the city, the station that was the Warner Brothers Affiliate of the Year sweeping Emmy competitions. It was an exciting and often glamorous career that came with perks, like mingling with sports icons, astronauts, and actors to raise money for various charities. Markham's rise to the top of an industry dominated at the time by men was not only remarkable, but often challenging as she fought back against discrimination and sexual harassment in the boys club environment. Featured in various publications, she was often the only female executive in a sea of men. Much more than a powerhouse in broadcasting, Markham turned life-threatening health challenges into positive change to help others. Diagnosed with breast cancer at 27, she partnered with Senator Dianne Feinstein to raise awareness and money by launching the first breast cancer research stamp inaugurated by the U.S. Post Office in 1998. After an excruciating period in her life, when she had four hip replacements in less than five years, she founded a website to empower and educate people who, like herself, received recalled hip devices. Her entrepreneurism continues today. As CEO of Fueled Consults, Markham helps startups get a leg up on the competition by vetting resources and vendors and sharing her gold mine of connections. When I think of Lisa Markham, you have blazed more trails than just about anybody I know. Uh, let's begin with television. You started in the mid 90s here in San Diego. You were hired mm -hmm. by Tribune Company to lead the television station. The, the first woman to be hired by Tribune in that capacity in 150 years. In that capacity, yes. That is insane. hard to believe. Yeah, what it was is. That like? You know, I've been in the business so long, and what preceded San Diego was Fresno and Sacramento. So I already had about 15, 16 years under my belt and knowing the landscape, knowing that all the men owned all the local television stations, they owned all the groups, and there's a difference between an owner of television stations that's independent and then when the network comes in and the network buys their own station in New York or Chicago or LA and they're called O and O's which is the acronym for owned and operated all the rest are owned by a lot of other broadcasters and back then there were so many of them um, but every convention every conference every place where we would go and buy programming men 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 and you go oh there's a woman over there. And typically they were in promotion. Um, they, they, they weren't even that many in sales. Which but is they weren't crazy. at the top of the food chain. No, not at all. And you were the sole <laughs> person. What, what was it like working in an environment dominated by men at that time? You know, I, I, if I think back to it, I really didn't think about it that much, honestly, because I wasn't raised with a father and I wasn't raised by a father in the 50s and that's really important because if you look at the way women were treated by their husbands in the 50s it was how dare you even get a job much less would their daughters do that you know the daughters were supposed to marry right did you have a strong mom so oh my god incredible yeah my mom was amazing um and 
she was tough. She wasn't unkind, but she laid the facts down for you. This so is, this she is the environment. She toughened your skin, so when you were in the environment with a, a bunch of men, TV executive types, it felt normal for you? Um, Did you feel I, special? Different? No, I, I just was always very aware of my femininity and to make sure I cast that aside and that I immediately started with business. Mm -hmm. So they would know I'm all about business. If anything, I wanna be just like you. Meaning guys can do a lot of stuff, how come I can't? Why can't I make the same amount of money? That's, that's really what got me going. How did you persevere in this environment? How did you succeed? What did you have to do differently? Anything? Yes, I worked very, 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 very hard. Uh, when they told me, because I started in sales, um, go call on this many people this week. And let's say it was 10 that had to be on your call sheet in that week. I would do 15. If they said you had to close this deal and we want one a week, I would do three. And I knew I could do it because I know that when I walked into an advertiser, I could ask them all the right questions. And then I could go back and I could parlay how my product, my service, my station would fit them. And so I knew they'd have to say yes to me. One incident you remember in particular that you were really proud of, some accomplishment that happened as a result of your tenacity? Um, I was usually the top salesperson anywhere I went, and I loved that. Where it got askew was as soon as I would get to that point, um, let's say a misogynist that would run the television station would get in my way. Meaning I knew that they either did not like women maybe even they loathed women or they were just sexually attracted to anything that walked by and I would be the one because I was the only woman there mm -hmm. so I got it by a process of there just weren't any other women and then when that happened now you're getting in my way of making money you're getting in my way of my ultimate goal was which was to run and build TV stations and so that's when that started to happen to me. I decided, well, I've just got to nip this in the butt. I've got to take these guys down. What'd you do? Sued. And how'd that go? Good. Really good. <laughs> um, in fact, I actually learned the art of suing um, when I was about 22 and my whole apartment burned down to the ground. And I just knew it couldn't burn down with the nine other units there all on its own. Something had to be the cause. And I kept asking the landlord and I kept asking people like, we don't know, we have to find out. And that, you know, it's just something's not right here. And then I remembered back about a month before there was a chimney sweep person up on the roof. And I remembered his name because he had the funny little hat on. So, you know, this is back cell phones, look him up in the phone book, right? And call them and say, you know, you were at this complex a month ago. What is it that you were doing? And he told me, he said, oh, I was trying to tell the landlord it was in such disrepair and that there were no flutes in the chimney, which would prevent, let's say, some cardboard. Somebody would, you know, put in their fireplace. Right. And it would come back on the shake roof and it would burn the whole thing down. And they chose year after year not to do anything about so it. So negligent, negligence. Yep. And I thought, okay, now I know the truth. Now I get an attorney. And so that, I think I've sued 11 entities by now. And one of the things I would like to have told women, but I didn't know because I was going through it, which is, God, I wish I would have done this sooner. Been more comfortable. With women do tend to get, oh, it's a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And it's emotional, and it's all this. I used to think that way, not anymore. So, I handle it just the way men do. It's just business. So at the age of 22, you, you sued for the fire that mm -hmm. was uh, destroyed the apartments yes. and, and won. Yes. Wow. And you won your lawsuit against Tribune Company as well. Well, there were more before that, too. There were more as I, the big one was probably Sacramento, the CBS affiliate, which was, that was back in the day of who shot JR. So Dallas was the number one show. And here I came from radio from Fresno. And they thought, well, you should just be lucky we hired you. And I was in sales. But there were seven other guys and just me. So the general sales manager and the general manager were very nice at first. And then suddenly the GSM 
who oftentimes had a little powder around his nose no, back in that day, um, came up to my cubicle one day and put his arms up here. He was 6'6", six, six, and I had roses from my boyfriend, and he said, wow, Markham, you must be a really good to no. get those roses. And he started laughing. And as I turned around, I saw not one other man laughing. In fact, their heads were down in shame. They were embarrassed for me. So I knew, wait a minute, I've got, if they're acting this way, how has traffic been treated? Mm -hmm. How's the news department being treated? Everybody else, it's not just me. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm gonna get you for this. Sexual harassment. You bet. And that was another and lawsuit. That, and that, he, he did it. It was, it was systemic all the way to the top of Corinthian Broadcasting, which was a large broadcasting company then. They are no more. So the hurdles that you, when we say trailblazing, I mean, it, it, it is true, but there were so many different hurdles that you did have to overcome and a lot of collateral damage along the way. Yeah. I mean, that, what you're talking yeah. about is not easy breezy filing a lawsuit. That must have been very difficult. It was, but at the same token, it was very empowering because the men that I worked for that's all we talked about. We had Sidley and Austin, a huge Washington DC law firm for our interest there in Washington. Um, the stations of course had legal. We had legal on payroll. They were in house. This is legal, legal, legal. And the men were always dealing with them. The women weren't. Well, you know, Speaking of women in power, the women in the workplace, uh, the environment has changed significantly and a huge glass ceiling was just broken mm -hmm. with uh, the election. Uh, Vice President Kamala mm -hmm. Harris, yes. first woman uh, in the United States to be vice president. And you have a connection to her, Wish don't her you? Wish her Godspeed. Yeah. Oh, it was years and years ago I met her, but it was really Dianne Feinstein that and and i make no bones about saying i'm an independent i voted for both mm -hmm. but i always make sure i educate myself on what's going on on both sides i have some people that say oh i don't even watch that station i don't watch that network because they're this you always have to watch both to have both sides but no it was uh it was diane feinstein that truly changed the trajectory of my life because it was a very powerful woman and she and i connected the second i went to see her in the Senate at the time. And she was very powerful then. And you were powerful too. You were in uh, the, the uh, National Association. I was president Association. of California Broadcasters. Again, the first woman, well, I think the only woman, still crazy. Um, but obviously she liked that. When I said who I am and what I'm representing, and it was local broadcasters at that time we were doing a Got her attention. Bill. But when she, she, somehow it came out that I'd had breast cancer when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh my goodness, my brother has breast cancer and we're fighting it right now. And immediately everything went away. And she said, there should be something that we can do, government can do. And we together came up with the idea of the first breast cancer nonprofit stamp. So the United States Postal Service created this stamp and X amount of profits went towards cancer research. Wow. You were yeah. 22 when you were diagnosed with breast cancer, that, right? In your early 20s? 27. 27, right. okay. Mm -hmm. Right wow. before I had my first child. It's so unusual to be diagnosed at that young age. How did you deal with that? Well, you know, I already knew there was issues with me because my mother took DES. Okay. And that's just another, it's a drug Risk. that pharmaceuticals gave back in the 50s and 60s to women to prevent a miscarriage if they started bleeding early. And uh, I knew she had taken it because I was having issues when I was eight, nine, and 10 uh, with a growth in my urethra. So what this drug did is it causes a super shot of estrogen inside the embryo. And there's a deformity that happens. Worst case scenario, the women are infertile. Some, so were some of the men, but mostly it was 80% of the children of those mothers were infertile and could never have children. Wow. And I have five very dear friends and we're all DES. So I already knew from being in the hospital so much when I was little that you were I at risk. probably, I was at a good risk for cancer. I just didn't think it would happen. Right, but you had treatment and you, you, you've did. been fine since I had a clearly. fabulous doctor that told me not to get chemotherapy because it was discovered young when I was so young and to get um, surgery and radiation. And I did. And then it came back 
after my second child, but I beat it again. This is only one of the health challenges. You also mm -hmm. um, have a form of arthritis and you had a hip replacement surgery that turned into an absolute nightmare yes. because of uh, negligence and a defective part that was placed in your body. And you turned that around to not only persevere physically and emotionally, but to help other people too. Let's talk about that a little bit. That was important. Yes. Yes. Um, so um, what everyone needs to know is in the United States, there is no national joint registry. And all that means is when they put a part inside of you, there's a skew on it. You know, it's inventory. The hospital buys X amount of parts from medical device companies. Let's say Depew, Johnson & Johnson is one of them. Mm -hmm. And that is a skew that says, if you ever watch Forensic File and they find a body of somebody, they have a hip replacement, they'll go look at that skew and they know who that person was. That is supposed to be in a National Joint Registry. But for years, the medical device companies have lobbied Washington to make sure we don't have one. But they do in every other civilized country. And that way, if they're putting in something defective, the person comes back and says, you know, doc, that isn't, it doesn't feel right. There's something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. They can look up on that registry and they can see this part is defective. Not in the United States of America in 2020. So there's, we have a wall for the patient to know. There, the patient didn't know that the doctor sometimes bought the parts and then got uh, vacations for he, mostly he, because they're orthopedic surgeons and their wives. Um, got grants given to them, a little money over here, never had to disclose they had a financial interest right. and in that device. Right, and there were thousands of patients just like you that suffered around as a result world, of it. Around the world, and we're not, we're, I just found out because it was not one defective hip, but two, and so that's another story. But that knees and shoulders and uh, vaginal meshes, you've heard about them, um, the mosculators. Um, they were all granted under a, a, pre, a, a PMA, which is a pre-market device. They never had to go through the rigorous testing the FDA, and everybody knows FDA, oh, that drug's going to take so long. They can bypass that, so and they do. You sued Johnson & Johnson. I was, I was one of about um, total, there was 90,000 in the United States, only about 5,000 people went down that journey and then half of them dropped out mm -hmm. because it was far too evasive and personal. I was just that much more dedicated right. to see it to the end. And now because of that action, there is more transparency, right? Those devices are off the market. That was what the deal was mm -hmm. in the lawsuit. And They're off the market. It's, it's, a, it's a, a metal on metal. They're no longer allowed, they've been pulled off the shelves. There are other devices though that are defective and they're still in circulation. Mm -hmm. So this is why I wanted to start the website. I wanted to be there for people that weren't getting the truth and I wanted to make them aware you must know what's going in you before they open you up. So you started hiphelp.org, mm -hmm. which is a website that has um, so many great resources. It has stories about what people like yourself have gone through right. and resources where people can turn to find out about their devices right. and, and, and how they can fight back. Right. So that must be very gratifying to know that you've made a huge difference in that regard. If it was just one person, I'd be fine with that. But where interesting what it came down to is I had men, I gave my personal phone number 24 seven. I'd have men call me in their fifties in the Midwest where there's not a lot of doctors and they had so much pride. They couldn't tell their wives. They'd call me and they would cry. In pain? In pain, but cry. They couldn't go to work. They could never provide for their, for their, their wives, their children anymore. And it, that to me, that made me so angry, but I've always used my anger as a way of winning. So what advice do you give to, to, to women entrepreneurs and for people who are, are watching right now? Uh, I know that you say it's so important to share your story oh. and to, to ask questions and to rely on other women. Do you, do you find that women are helpful to each other in society? And what advice do you have for women out there who are trying to pivot and trying to change things and, you know, succeed in this very difficult environment? Well, I want to say I give so much applause to the Me Too movement. 
I, I can tell you when those women were testifying about what happened to them, I don't care if it was 10, 20 years ago. I could see it in their eyes. They were all telling the truth. And back then too, everything was about an NDA. I'll, I'll settle with her, but she's gonna sign an NDA. Non-disclosure agreements. That's right, that's right. And that's why women stopped talking. And now finally, it's forget the NDA. I'm gonna talk. That's the first course of action. So I, I am so excited when we get over the pandemic and everybody gets back to work. I think women, even though they were the first hurt and had to come home and take care of the children, yeah. I think once they get back out there again, I think it's gonna be a whole different situation because women are incredible at pivoting. We literally come out of the birth canal pivoting. Mm -hmm. So we're just that good at juggling so many things. So you think that 2020 is really a wash for so many people. Everything's been put on hold. It's like we're frozen in time a little bit. Yeah. You think that we'll pick up in 2021 or late 2021 and the Me Too movement will continue strong? I do. I, and I, I say that because I remember when I had a lot of my failed surgeries with all these defective devices, several of them. Um, I had to be home and in bed and watching TV. Naturally, that's my industry, so I watch a lot of television, click, click, click. And I remember one time it was the great spill off the Gulf Coast and our oceans were never gonna be the same again because of the amount of oil that had spilled. Um, five years later, it was basically cleaned up and gone. They said it was gonna be forever that that would happen. Several years ago, I'm watching TV again, back from another defective hip removal, and I see live the Boston bombing. And it was, Boston will never be the same again. People will never, there'll never be another run again. There'll never be a Boston marathon. They came back stronger. The same people that were in it, that had limbs gone, they came back, they ran again. Same with Katrina. Another operation, and I'm watching. New Orleans will never be the same again. So I don't believe anybody that says, this is gonna change forever. This is a blip in the radar for us. We will get over it, but we have to do everything we can to help small business, everything. Once we can go out and uh, shop, play, and support our local businesses. I love your optimism. I love your optimism. And I love the fact that you are so willing to share your story. It really is a gift when women share their stories and talk about not only their successes, but their their failures and their challenges, because that's kind of where the learning comes in, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, absolutely. So when- And getting older is wonderful. Just, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I can't wait to be a year older. Well, you have, you've raised two daughters, mm -hmm. so you really have- a, a, With the help of my wonderful husband. Yes, you have a lot of balance in your life. I mean, all the success, has not uh, been at the expense of, of your family. And how did you do that? That's really, that's, that's amazing to have the whole ball of wax going on here. Well, uh, I am very lucky. God gave me the constitution. I don't require a lot of sleep. <laughs> so, so I got lucky there. I take no credit for that. Um, but I, I like to be busy. I like to multitask. I like to get things done. It's a great feeling of accomplishment. I think when a woman is secure, there's no stopping her. It's when she starts getting insecure because she's listening to other voices or she's too hard on herself because she didn't get everything done that day at work and at home and the husband's not happy. Stop being so hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Have a drink, do whatever you're gonna do, go to bed, get up mm -hmm. and do it again. But don't be so hard on yourself because any day that anybody does anything, a woman's, a woman's gonna do it 10 times faster and probably better. Well, you are certainly uh, someone to just, you provide so much inspiration. And I adore you. I know. You I adore you. So I think so you've been one of the greatest achievements San Diego has ever had in broadcasting. You're not, you're, you weren't a broadcaster. You were a person that when everybody saw you turned on to Sandra Moss, they went, she makes me feel comfortable. Aww. So congratulations. You touch the hearts of men and women and everyone that watched you. So, you, and you've done an amazing job and you, you've just started yourself. You've inspired me to, I can't wait for the next chapter. And uh, after listening- And there will be many. There will be. So what do you say? We, we go uh, do a little more- Absolutely. Okay, Let's do it. Ready? Let's right. do it. Let's <laughs> go. Okay.
Wait. Oh, no. Yeah, but don't. But, but.